Zach is back. It's the Zach Gelb Show on Fox Sports 920, The Jersey. All right, 515 from the Princeton Orthopedic Associates Studio. Zach Gelb Show here until 6 o'clock today. 609-919-9200 is the number. Less than 24 hours until the trade deadline. What will the Sixers do? Will Okafor be on his way out? Will the Knicks be trading Derrick Rose? And maybe will Brooke Lopez be traded from the Brooklyn Nets? And now joining us is a longtime great mind in the NBA, the fantastic front office executive, and that's Rod Thorne, who's kind enough to hop on board with us right now. Rod, Zach Gelb, Fox Sports 920, The Jersey. Thanks for a few minutes, and how are you? I'm doing great, Jack. Well, thank you for coming on, and we do appreciate it. This time for a GM or a president in an organization under 24 hours to go until the trade deadline, what is it like for someone that you've been in that situation many times? Uh, most of the times uh, it's pretty hectic, uh, Zach, because there are a lot of conversations uh, transpiring. Um, you know, you hear a lot of rumors, and particularly with the social media we have today, uh, you hear even more rumors than you used to. Uh, but the reality is that uh, most of the uh, rumors are, you know, will prove to be unfounded. And, uh, uh, you know, there'll be se- probably several things done in the last day. There have already been some things done. Uh, but normally uh, a lot of talk, a lot of noise, if you will, and, uh, you know, not that much gets done. But uh, there sure is a lot of talk this year. You always want the GM or the front office member to be the one that informs the player if they're being traded. And sometimes that doesn't happen now, like you're saying, in our age of social media. When you see a rumor maybe involving one of your players, how do you handle that? Do you talk to the player if there's a rumor out there about him? Well, in, in the uh, – yeah, I think, I think everybody, you know, sort of treats that differently. Yeah, Zach, you know, was always – you know, when I was a GM, I always, um, you know, if you saw a rumor out there, uh, you know, I would normally uh, speak to the player, uh, particularly if he were a good player. And, uh, uh, you know, what always players because you really don't, you don't want to lie to players, you know, if you, if you could possibly help it. And, you know, what I always said to the players or the team in, in general was that anybody can be traded. Uh, obviously, there are some who it's much less likely for them to be traded, but anybody can be traded. I mean, some of the greatest players in the history of the NBA have been traded. Uh, so if the right deal is out there and a team feels it can help itself, or in, in some instances, it, 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 you know, it could have to do with the salary cap, uh, uh, you know, then the teams are going to do it. Rod Thorne with us right now on the Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports 920, the Jersey. The Sixers there have a new GM. We all know that in Brian Colangelo. No more Sam Hinkie here. Where's your confidence in Brian Colangelo right now, Rod? I think uh, Brian is very good. I think if you look at uh, Brian's history with uh, Phoenix and also with uh, Toronto, that uh, uh, he has done very well in both places, uh, made some good trades, and uh, – I think the uh, Sixers are in uh, good hands with Brian. I, I think he'll do an excellent job with them. And the reason they're in such a good spot is because of what Sam Hinkie did. And I wasn't the biggest Sam Hinkie supporter, but you see what has happened from this. You have Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons. You have the Lakers pick and then also uh, the pick from the Kings. When you look at what Sam Hinkie did, what's your philosophy on the whole tanking thing? And will we possibly see more teams tank in the future years? And that, you know, that, that's a very good question, uh, Jack. Uh, um, you know, obviously the uh, Sixers um, have some talented players now, and they're in a position to add some more, you know, over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, it's been, what, four years? This is the fourth year. Yeah. Uh, you know, they haven't been very good for four years. Uh, you know, to me, the... Uh, you know, it's about, you know, you want to be competitive. You want to, you know, you want to make the playoffs. Uh, you want to do as well as you can. But, uh, you know, it's it's obviously uh, Philadelphia's organization made a, uh, 
you know, made a commitment uh, four years ago when uh, Sam was hired that they were going to go in a, in a certain direction, and uh, they went in that direction. And, you know, Sam obviously is no longer there, but uh, they sure have some uh, nice young talent on their team. Would you agree that with the very lack of great teams in the NBA right now, like, for example, everyone thinks it's just going to be Cleveland and then also the Golden State Warriors, do you think it makes it a little bit easier if a team wanted to go that route of saying, okay, let's tank because the odds of us getting the ultimate goal to a championship right now are very slim? Well, you know, even even if you quote-unquote tank, that, you know, it's no sign that you're going to get great players. Uh, because there is a lottery, and even if you have the worst record, you're again you're not guaranteed anything other than the fourth pick. And you know some picks aren't you know aren't great. Uh, some years the the talent level is not nearly as you know as good as it is others. Uh, there aren't that many franchise players you know who come through the draft. Uh, San Antonio was lucky enough to get two of them in a ten year period, but. Overall, there are you know, a lot of good players, but very few franchise players. So it's uh, it, it's not a surefire way to uh, you know to to get to where you want to be. And then there's a lot of angst, you know, while you're getting there anyway. So you know there are different ways to do things. Rod, you know, in being in this job in the past, and in any job, communication is really essential. And whether it was with Henke or now Colangelo. The Sixers have been killed for their communication skills. And I've said it before. I don't want my GM or my president of basketball of operations telling me every single thing. But when it comes to big injuries with big players, you would like to see them be a little bit more transparent. Just take me on your philosophy through the years of communication inside the organization and then also the obligation that you have in order to keep the fans in the loop to some extent. Well, you know, Zach, uh, it's, uh, you know, obviously it's different with each, you know, with each organization. Uh, I think that most, you know, try to be as uh, open as possible. Obviously, there are certain things that you would rather not be public uh, regarding what, you know, what you're trying to do. But uh, I always felt that if you were, you know, if you were honest and uh, upfront, that uh, it tended to work out better in the long run. Because if you're not, uh, sooner or later, <laughs> you have, uh, everybody's going to find out that you weren't. So, anyway, so uh, it's you know, uh, but 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 again, you know, everybody's different. And obviously, here in Philadelphia, I think Brian Colangelo and Brett Brown communicate. But there's some times where they, even under Henke, they put Brett Brown out there to dry and answer those tough questions. Just since you've had so much experience and you dealt with the bevy of coaches, how was your communication skills, you think, with the uh, from the GM position then to the coaching position? Well, you know, to me, Zach, it's critical that the GM and the coach are, you know, on the same uh, uh, level as far as, you know, what's, what's, what's going on with the team, what they want out of the team, and, you know, what they're looking for. I think it works a lot better if the communication is good. Sometimes it isn't, um, you know, as good as you would like it. Uh, you know, it's a really, really tough job being a coach in professional basketball because at the end of the day, it's, you know, all about winning. And uh, sometimes you don't have the talent level to win as, you know, well as you'd like to. Uh, but it works a lot better if there's a communication, if there's a common uh, idea of what you want to do, and if uh, you know if if they, you know, they don't have to be best buddies, but uh, the, you know, there's got to be a professional courtesy, and there's got to be, um, you know, you, you've got to be able to work together on a professional level. Rod Thorne with us right now on the Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports 920, the Jersey. We all know the Sixers are trying to trade Jill Okafor, and other teams are sensing that desperation level from the Sixers to make a trade. Right now, what do you think the Sixers would be satisfied with in return for Jill Okafor? Let's say if you were the GM, what would you be satisfied with? You know, Zach, uh, that, that's an, that, that's impossible for me to answer. Uh, uh, you know, you hear so many rumors. Um He's a, you know, he's a fine young player. Um, there aren't many bigs, you know, in the league with the skill level that he has. And 
uh, you know, when you're trying to ascertain, you know, you want to know what what the uh, uh, value of each of your players with is vis-a-vis the league. And when you're trying to ascertain that, uh, uh, you know, the league will let you know, you know, what the value is. And, you know, I, I would be remiss if I said I'm, I know what that value is right now of, you know, anybody that you see out there uh, that, you know, you, you read their name as, as a possibility for a trade. But uh, in Philadelphia's case, I'm sure they have gauged what they want for whomever they are, uh, you know, talking uh, uh, about. And uh, if they get that, then maybe they'll do something. And if they don't, then they don't have to, they don't have to do anything. Rod Thorne with us right now. Rod, when you look at the current state of the Sixers franchise, it's centered around the two players that we think are going to be very big transcendent players in Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. We've seen Embiid. We haven't seen Simmons so far. What are your impressions on Embiid, and what type of player do you think Ben Simmons can be for Philadelphia? I think Embiid is one of the best young players in the league. Uh, I think that – uh, his skill level, his size, his athleticism, uh, you know, put him in a, a very rare ca- category. I think, obviously, if he stays healthy, uh, he should be a terrific NBA player for a long time. Uh, Simmons has got great size, great passing ability, very athletic. Uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a shame that he hasn't been able to play this year. Uh, you know, with his injury, but uh, there's no reason he shouldn't be a terrific NBA player, too. When you look at Embiid, the great part about this story is the guy has only been playing basketball for five to six years. Uh, Like, Rod, to me, it's amazing how much more room he has to grow in this game with just his limited experience playing basketball, also with how much he's been hurt. Uh, He's he's an incredible talent, Uh, you know, and both on both ends of the court. And plus, he can shoot. You know, most of the time, if a player's a good post-up player, is uh, you know his outside skills aren't that good. Uh, Embiid can shoot up. You know, he can shoot beyond the three-point line. And defensively, because he's such a great athlete and he's so quick off his feet, uh, he, he's going to he's going to be a rim protector. Uh, and that is a great thing to have in this league, and particularly with how difficult it is to keep players from the basket because of, uh, you know, the hand-checking rules we have now. And uh, uh, you see so many smaller players that get to the, you know, get to the basket uh, virtually at will now. Uh, And Embiid is going to be a real rim protector. So, uh, you know, sky's the limit for him. Uh, You know, he just needs to keep working and uh, stay healthy. And uh, he he should be – you know, one of the better players in the league. The health is everything that everyone in Philadelphia is holding their breath on, and the Sixers are being very extremely careful with how they handle Embiid with the minutes restriction and then also not playing him back-to-back. Eventually they're going to know, and they're going to have to take the training wheels off of Joel Embiid as this thing continues to progress. As a GM, when do you know when it's time to take the training wheels off and say, hey, we just got to play this guy more? Well, you know, he's missed two full years. And uh, this year uh, there's been a minutes re- restriction. And, he's, you know, he's had a couple of uh, small injuries, I guess, uh, this year. So uh, it's understandable that the Sixers would be um, overly protective of him because, not, number one, he's, you know, the, he, he's going to be the face of the franchise. Uh, going forward, and they want to make sure they do everything in their power to uh, give him every opportunity to remain healthy. Rod, before we let you run, I have to just look at a few things that you have done during the course of your career, because I also grew up as a big Nets fan, so we'll talk about the Nets in just a second. Uh, But going back to the draft process of Michael Jordan, take me back to what you remember about that time period. Well, uh, there, you know, we had a second pick in the draft, and about a month before the draft, uh, I had a conversation with uh, Stu Inman of the Trailblazers, uh, the late Stu Inman, and um, I asked him uh, who they were going to take, and he said if Bowie passed the physical, they were going to take Bowie. You know, they had Clyde Drexler, 
and they had Jim Paxson, you know, two uh, two really good uh, uh, wing players. And uh, so about a week before the draft, I had another conversation with Stu, and I asked him about um, – a buoy, and he said Bowie had passed the physical. So, you know, a week before the draft, I knew they were going to take uh, Bowie unless something, you know, out of the ordinary uh, transpired between then and the draft. And sure enough, on draft day, uh, uh, Houston took Elijah Wan, and they took Bowie. And uh, Michael, uh, you know, was we were fortunate to, to be in a position to uh, to draft him. What type of player did you think Michael was going to be when you took him? You know, Zach, at the time, you know, my feeling was that he's going to be a very good player. Uh, I wish I were prescient enough uh, to have uh, seen what kind of player he would turn out to be. Uh, You know, I I was hopeful that he would be obviously a starter and a very good player, but it became very evident very quickly that he was, you know, a special player and then as he went on, he became, you know, arguably the best player ever. So uh, I don't know, you know, I, can, I can't say that I thought he was going to turn out to be what he turned out to be, but we had high hopes that he would be, you know, a very good player. When was that first moment that you realized, hey, we got something a little bit better than what we expected? Well, you know, uh, I, I was doing something at the time and wasn't at the first practice, so – after practice, uh, after the first practice, I got a call from uh, Bill Blair, who was an assistant coach at the time, and he said to me, "Well, you didn't, you didn't uh, screw this draft up." <laughs> and uh, I said, okay. And then the next day, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I had a conversation with Kevin Lockley, who's the head coach, and uh, Kevin said, uh, "I think this guy's going to be pretty good." And, uh, you know, coaches are, are normally uh, reticent when it comes to praising players who haven't done anything, you know, while be, uh, yet. And so I, I'm thinking, boy, we, we, this guy must be pretty good. So then I went over and watched, and uh, he was clearly the best player on the floor. And uh, you could see that uh, he was going to be, you know, he was going to be a starter. He was going to be a very good player for us right away. Unbelievable. Well, Rod, I always have to say thank you to you for the job that you did with the Nets. When you look back at that team, I know you guys didn't win a championship, but when you remember the days that the New Jersey Nets at the time had in the arena that changed names about 10,000 times, uh, what are some of the fond memories that stand out to you? Oh, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, getting Jason Kidd in the trade, which which made our team uh, – uh, what a what a wonderful team we had with with Jason and Terry Kittles and Kenyon Martin, uh, uh, Keith Van Horn, uh, uh, Ken, uh, uh, Tom McCullough. We had Jason Collins, Richard Jefferson. I mean, we we had a very uh, Lucius Harris. We had a very very good team, and you know we went to the finals two years in a row. Uh, the first year when we played the Lakers, the Lakers were really good. And we could not do anything with Shaq. Shaq played incredibly well against us. The second time when we played uh, San Antonio, I, I felt we we had a decent matchup with them, and we would have a good chance. And you know, it went right. You know, we played them six games and ended up uh, blowing a twelve point lead in the fourth quarter of Game Six. Uh, so we, we we had a heck of a run, you know, four division championships, two conference championships uh, during that run. But uh, Jason Kidd, when we got Jason Kidd, that, that's what changed the whole thing around. And I love Jason Kidd when he was a player. He's my favorite basketball player growing up. And Kerry Kittle's coach is up the road from us right now as an assistant right. on the Princeton staff. And Kerry was in here during the summer, and I told him, I go, it's so odd how I feel about Jason Kidd because I loved him as a player, but then when he was a coach of the Nets, he was just there for a quick sip of coffee, and now the Nets are in a big, just disaster situation. How much does it hurt you to see the state of where the Nets are right now? Well, the uh, you know the the Nets went all in when they made the trade with Boston for uh, Pierce and Garnett. And, you know, they got made the playoffs, won a round of the playoffs that first year. And, 
you know, it hadn't hadn't been as good since. But uh, uh, and now Boston has, a, you know, they've got a still got you know a couple picks from them. So you know they're they're trying to retool. I see they made a trade today, and uh, they're trying to get assets, you know, to get first round draft picks and. You know, trying to come come back. Uh, Sean Marks, I think, it will do a really good job for him as a GM. A uh, very bright young man, and uh, you know, it's not easy, uh, Zach. Uh, you know, once you're down, to come back. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that, given some time, that uh, you know, the Nets will make some good decisions and be back quicker than most people think. Did it hurt you to see that Jason only lasted so short in New York? You know, it. Uh, uh, you mean New York or or Brooklyn? Brooklyn. You talking about as a player or a coach? I'm, coach? Ta- I'm talking about as a coach. Yeah. Oh, as a coach. Um, well, you know, he's with Milwaukee now, and uh, they've got some good young players out there. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the uh, you know the circumstances were, uh, were uh, when he left uh, Brooklyn. Uh, but whatever they were, uh, he did a good job with the Nets. You know when he was there, and uh, now he's uh, you know trying to help rebuild uh, you know the the uh, Milwaukee franchise. So I, I think he's done a good job as coach, and I'm sure he will continue to do that. Rod Thorne, final one before we let you run. Let's stay in New York, and we'll go to the team that plays at Madison Square Garden. Phil Jackson's been having a rough time in New York. Just evaluate the job Phil has done, and I don't really see how the Knicks turn this thing around. How about yourself, Rod? Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, Phil's been now a couple years. Uh, they, uh, you know, they made some major free agent signings this past supper, summer with Rose and and uh, Jennings and uh, Joe Team Noah, uh, along with Courtney Lee. And, uh, you know, it looked on paper as if they were going to be good. And uh, so far, uh you know, they've had a struggle. There's so much uh, talk, you know, in the press about, you know, what they're going to do, what they're not going to do. And uh, but, but, you know, in the East, I think they still have an opportunity to, to make the playoffs. Uh, they're probably two and a half, three games out of the playoffs right now, so they still have an opportunity. Uh, what will happen with Melo uh, here in the next couple of days, uh, you know, we'll have to see. He does have a no trade, so... Any, any uh, place that they want to trade him, uh, he has to want to go. So, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens. But they do have some talented players on that team. Well, Rod, we appreciate the time. This is a whole lot of fun. Definitely a thrill growing up watching your teams play uh, in New Jersey. But I appreciate the time today. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks, Zach. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. There's Rod Thorne joining us. But that's just so funny. And he covered a lot. And he was really good on the Sixers stuff. And very good with uh, some of the stuff on the Knicks and also the Nets because that man built a fantastic basketball team with the Nets. But with Jason Kidd, it's as if my relationship with Jason Kidd is as some girl that you were so close with, you're dating her for eight years, she's your first love, and then she wakes up one day and just says, later I'm out, I'm going to some other dude. That's what it's like because I love Jason Kidd. Jason Kidd growing up, I had the number five jersey, that gray New Jersey Nets jersey. I remember I met him a few times. One of my friend's father did did a lot of work with him. So I got a chance to meet Jason Kidd a few times. I love Richard Jefferson, Kerry Kittles, Tenyon Martin, all those guys. And then Jason Kidd became the coach. And I remember being at that press conference, and I was a little kid in a candy store talking to Jason Kidd. I asked him some question about Joe Johnson. And the next thing I know, it was a disaster in Brooklyn. Him and Billy King can't get along. He wanted more power. Didn't really have any bargaining rights because, and I'm not a big fan of Billy King, but he's only been in a coach for one year. And the next thing you know, he goes to Milwaukee. And Jason Kidd leaving Milwaukee really ruined the way I've become a fan of the Nets. Because I used to be a big Nets fan, and now... I don't usually watch a lot of games because the team's not that good. The team stinks. They're horrific to watch. They're 9-47. and 47. They're 0-10 and 10 in the division this year. At home, want to go to home game? You've seen seven wins this year. 
And they play in the Barclays Center, which is just a dark building. The Barclays Center is good for one thing. Concerts. And I'll actually give it two. College basketball. Other than that, who wants to see an Islanders game in the Barclays Center? Who wants to see a Nets game in the Barclays Center? No. Sorry. Unless if the Cavs or Warriors are coming in. But with Rod, I, to say, I wanted to get his perspective because we a lot of times complain about the way GMs communicate to fans. I like to hear his answer on that kind of stuff. And also the communication with the coach and also some of the players during the deadline. It's a very busy time for a lot of these GMs. They don't get much sleep, obviously. 24, under 24 hours to go until the trade deadline. 609-919-D200. Zach Yelp Show, Fox Sports, 920 The Jersey. Time right now in the Princeton Orthopedic Associate Studios. 540, we'll take a quick break. We'll be back. When we come back, we'll talk a little Paul George and also the Flyers in action tonight. 8 p.m. game against the Capitals in South Philadelphia. Are the Flyers alive? Can they make a run? Or are they going to continue to sink? More of the Zach Yelp Show when we come back.